we had Chad Johnson on the show. I think he's yeah. changed his name back to Chad. And I covered him in college, and I want to play a tape. This is what he said about his time in New England, Belichick and Brady. So let's play the tape here if we could. It ain't really Belichick. It's what Tom demanded. It's what the veteran demanded. You know, Belichick didn't have to say anything because once you walked in, when you walk in that atmosphere, you already know. You feel it. You feel it. That, that culture is like. Serious. Yes. Like, you know, it's like, it's like, I always use the example of, remember Full Metal Jacket? Remember the beginning of Full Metal Jacket? Hell yes. <laughs> That's what it's like walking in there, man. <laughs> and I don't think, you know, it's, it's, it's not a bad thing. It's a great thing because there's a reason why they're so successful, the way that ship is run. Well, it's funny, Willie. You played in the best culture in the league, New England, and the worst, <laughs> Cleveland. I knew you was going there. But can you, does it feel different walking into the room? Well, I didn't know anything else for my 12 years because I had I started with Parcells. Right. So you talk about Full Metal Jacket. It, it started <laughs> with Parcells, and then I had Pete, and then I had Belichick. So I had three of the best coaches that's ever coached the game. Incredible. And then I had Romeo Cornell as my head coach, who was my defensive coordinator. So he tried to implement that same system in Cleveland, but we just didn't have enough guys to buy in. So it was more of us that already had bought in in New England and we knew the winning uh, ingredient and what we needed to do. Those younger guys and those other guys in Cleveland didn't really understand that. And Chad, coming from a different type of organization, when he came in, yeah, he was a little shell shot. Well, Cincinnati was crazy. It was crazy. And there was, a, you know, talk about being disciplined and being accountable. There was a lot of things that were going on in Cincinnati that wasn't uh, tolerated in New England. You know, you know how big Pete Carroll is here. You, yep. you were a Trojan. I mean, when they show Pete's face <laughs> during USC games on the screen. People go crazy. They go, he is the all-time, he'll be like Saban in 20 years when they show his face on the screen in Alabama games. What was the difference, Pete, to Belichick, because they're both defensive guys. I just think style. I mean, you're shooting hoops. You're playing basketball in the meeting room. You're playing music in certain areas. Uh, Pete's got his coaches doing belly rolls in practice and jumping over bags and doing different things. It's energy, but it's still great coaching. And I think what's important for people to understand is you can win both ways if you have your hand on the players that are coming into your system, that you have a great relationship with the GM, and you could bring those style of players that fit what you're looking for. That's the key, Willie. That is the key. And players buy in. So players are going to buy in because it's your system and you're handpicking those guys that come in your system. The same with Belichick. He has control over everything that has to do with football operations. So those guys that come in, the system, the way you practice, the culture, whatever it is, they made it. Gruden to the Rams. You live in Los Angeles, and yeah. my takeaway has been they're building a new stadium. They need a star. And by the way, that doesn't mean the star can't coach. I mean, Gruden <laughs> can coach. Sean yep. Payton can coach. Harbaugh can coach. Pete Carroll can coach. I was told this last week and the week before. They want optically to pop. What do you make of Gruden? Like, he's been out of the league now for seven years, but he has done the draft. He's got his quarterback camp stuff. You see that. What do you make of it? He's a high uh, IQ in football. Um, he's great with quarterbacks. Yes. He can develop quarterbacks. And I think when you talk about the Rams, you talk about the one position that you need development and you need somebody to go out and produce in. And it's the quarterback position. So if there's a coach that can go out and implement a system, we talk about systems, a winning system, uh, and develop young players, especially at the quarterback position, I think he is an important and he is a viable candidate. Now, do I think that Jared Goff is ready to just come in in one year and take over and be that guy? I don't think so. So I've had conversations with people. Tony Romo is going to be available at the end of the season. Okay, now where do you think he goes? I think there's three teams that he can go to because he probably has maybe three years left. Three teams that he can go to that can win right now with a great defense, a running game, and a, a great team all the way around. Denver? Jets and Rams will be three teams that you can go to that you can redshirt quarterbacks. You got two quarter. You got a quarterback in with the Rams. You can redshirt, and you got a quarterback, two quarterbacks in New York that you can redshirt and let him and let him. I'm take surprised over. you didn't mention Arizona because they found that running back, that Johnson kid, yes, David they Johnson. Do. They do. See now, if I was Tony Romo, Arizona turns me on. I've got this young running back who has been the shock of the league. I know Bruce Arians likes quarterbacks. Yep. 
Now, I would have to face the Seahawks twice a year, but it's a dome team. I'm a little old and brittle. It's a nice environment. I play in a controlled weather environment. And, by the way, the NFC West is a warm weather conference. My road games are L.A. Yep. I got some rain in Seattle. San Francisco. No big deal. Temperate climate. I, to me, Arizona just That's jumps. That's a great one. But I just don't know the relationship. I just don't know where Carson Palmer is with Bruce Aarons. I don't know if he's ready to step okay. down. He just did a three-year deal. And I just don't know if – they're ready to part ways with Carson Palmer. Willie McGinnis, three-time Super Bowl champ. I got to ask you this question because it's it's really been an interesting one. Chris Carter said yesterday, I don't like players skipping bowls. Right. Uh, Joel Klatt came out and others, myself included, hey, if you're a star first-round running back pick and it's the, you know, blankety-blank bowl that doesn't matter – and you've had 600 carries under Nick Saban, you can skip it and I'm okay with it. Where do you land on this skipping bowl stuff? It was unheard of when I played, and probably when Chris Carter played as well. So, yeah, but you also played in Rose Bowls. <laughs> right. Oh, no, I didn't play in the Rose Bowl. That's the problem. We played in the Holiday Bowl and we played in the Sun Bowl, and I played in those bowls, and I was the fourth pick overall. But now things are changed. Players are changed. The system, this college thing has is, is changed. I do understand it, and I do understand where they're coming from. I don't agree with it. I think you're giving up on your teammates. I think you're giving up on your coach. I think players should play it out. I think regardless of your status or what your status may be in the NFL draft, I still think that you have to be there and that you have an obligation to finish the season with your teammates and give it all you got. And whatever's going to happen is going to happen anyway. You got insurance. You guys are covered regardless. But – these, these players make different decisions now, and I just don't have that mentality. Let me ask you this. If you go to the NFL and say you're the Jets or say you're one of these other teams that you're not going to make the playoffs, does that mean you're going to give up or quit on the team or you're just going to kind of – Throttle it down so you don't get hurt and you can make sure you're good for the next So season? if you were an NFL team, you'd be concerned about a kid who did this? I would think about it. You would think about it? I would think about it, yeah. It would cross my mind, and that's one of the questions I would probably pose to him uh, at the combine. Like, why did you not want to finish out or go ahead and gut it out? Because you could tell a player's character by when things are not going well. Everybody can jump on the bandwagon when things are great, and you're playing in the Big Bowl or Fiesta Bowl or the Rose Bowl or whatever. Everything's great. But when things are not going well and and, and, and you're, you're facing a little adversity Bowl. and you're yeah. in the Alamo Bowl – then that's when I, that's, that's the kind of guy. That's when I want to see what you really are made of or what you really are. You know, it's interesting, Willie. There's um, there's been this narrative over the last couple of years that a lot of these college kids come from tough backgrounds. Yep. And that they don't get paid, and they're asked to just play more games. Now we're up to twelve. Thir Alabama may play fifteen games. True. Did you feel like as a player? And I don't know your family background at all. Right. I have no idea your background. But did you ever feel used by the system? No, I, I felt that the system um, was was great for me because uh, without the NCAA or the system or the college and having a scholarship, I wouldn't have been able to play at USC. Okay, I, I didn't have the means, and then I, I did come from the inner city, so where it was tough, and and a lot of those things that these other kids face, I did face. But at the end of the day, um, it was a great opportunity for me to, opportunity for me to get into a college of that magnitude to sure. get my education to be able you to. You took move it forward. seriously. I took it real serious because, in my mind, through my education or football was my only way out. And how was I going to get to a school like that if I didn't play football? Okay. Now I, I do think the NCAA. Yeah, they do take advantage of players a little bit more, and they should give them a little more money so we don't see some of these outlandish things happening, yeah. like players selling their jerseys and doing things that, you know, because— To, to they, get a pizza on Friday. Right. And young men go through money in college, women as well, spend a lot of money in yeah. college, and what they're giving them is not enough. Yeah. So the money they make that goes into their pockets— should be a little bit more for the players. Yeah, I think we agree on that. Yeah. Uh, by the way, before we let you go, Willie McGinnis, three-time Super Bowl champ, is there a – when you look at the NFL, um, you know, I mean, we're going to get the Packers in the playoffs. It looks like the yep. Giants, the Cowboys. As a former Patriot, uh, do you do you have a relationship? Like, you root for New England? Or, or, like, to you, is it just all produce? It's a grocery store. It doesn't matter. You fill up the cart. Do you still <laughs> find yourself rooting for New England? Not when I play – 
Because <laughs> I didn't want to see him do great when I wasn't there. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah the year An I honest left, guy. The, the year I left, and they, and they went undefeated. I think it was 07. They were undefeated. I was like, wow, they're doing that without me. They could almost win a <laughs> Super Bowl and go undefeated, and I'm not a part of it. And the part of me was like, I wanted so badly to be there, and I wasn't. I didn't find myself rooting for him, but I had so many friends on the team. Um, my relationship with the owner, with Bob Kraft and, and Jonathan Kraft and his family, and, you know, with Belichick and all those people, I was able to forgive. And, yeah, I, you know, I wanted to see them do well in the end, but <laughs> as a player and a competitor, you don't want you don't want to see a team who, who kind of got you out of there or you, you left or you left and then see them do so great. Like, well, like some of these other players, yeah, we didn't need them anyway. We can go on You're the most honest them. guy ever. You're the guy admitting that when if you get a divorce, you want to see your ex-wife marry an ugly guy who's broke. <laughs> I have no problem with your honesty. So you were very happy when they lost. Nah, I wouldn't say no, I was you're, happy. You're I, being I, I just, honest. I, I was just saying, like, I mean, come on, guys. You guys going to go undefeated and win a Super Bowl without me? I was a little jealous. Of course. I was jealous. I was hoping ESPN literally said, we can't make any money. We're closing the shop when I left. <laughs> Hasn't happened that way. Great seeing you, Willie. Thanks for having me.